All right, so now that we are back into tank top weather, let us see if we can finish up this winter quilt. I'm going to start by making some bias tape. I've chosen this blue fabric as the, uh, the binding that will go all the way around the quilt. My straight edge is in storage, so I have to come up with a substitute. And I am just cutting off one yard of fabric. The instructions tell me to rip off the edge of the fabric for reasons? I, I don't know why. And then through a process that I can only describe as fabric folding voodoo, I put this thing into something resembling a square and then I start cutting pieces off. I legit have no idea what I am doing here or if I am doing it correctly. So I'm just sort of trying to follow the instructions on the YouTube video. No turning back. And I just convert the entire folded yard of fabric into the two inch strips of fabric, which will eventually become the binding while that goes all the way around the quilt. When you sew these together, you want a little bit of that tip sticking out. That's for your seam allowance. And they're just the wing sticking out. So today I am going to be finishing up my binding as far as getting it all prepped and ready to be sewn on. And I have purchased one of these little doohickeys off Amazon. It cost me $7. And the whole idea is that this is going to greatly reduce my labor, particularly over the next three quilts. Uh, so what this does, or at least what this is supposed to do, you take your uh, binding tape and you get the, make sure you've got it on the correct side there, this is the upside. Cut it all the way. Yeah. And you feed it into your little contraption. Just feed it, yeah. left, right, right is left, okay, yeah. You feed it in here. And, you know, theoretically, it works. Uh, yeah, okay, there we go. All right, so we got a little bit poking out there. I pull it out. And as it comes out, it's folded correctly for me to bake the bias tape. And I would just now iron this bit here. I iron it as I pull it down, as it comes out. And that should make the bias tape. Just be able to okay. so across. So I iron as I pull, and then I have some perfectly folded bias tape, ready to use.
Sue, I don't know where my batting is. I purchased two queen size wool batting uh, before the move and I was certain that I had brought it here because I knew I'd be working on the quilts here. I brought all my other sewing equipment here. But I don't seem to be able to locate the batting. Okay guys, it has been a couple days and we are trying to find this batting. I searched through all of our stuff in the room. My husband went through and searched through all the stuff in the room. We checked the storage unit. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to find this stuff. Just to give you an idea of what's going on, this is my invoice from November 2021. This was 13 months ago, and I purchased two queen-sized 100% wool batting, and they were $27 each. Now, if I go to this exact same store and I look up the exact same batting, uh, then we're looking at $81 each 13 months later. So there's some fun, fun inflation for you. I really do not want to have to buy this again. So we're, we're going to be searching the storage unit again. Uh, fortunately, if, if I do have to buy it again, Amazon at least has it for the low, low price of $53. So double what I paid 13 months ago. So... We move on. Okay, new plan. So we have been through this room, ripped it apart twice now, have not found the batting. We have gone through the storage unit twice now, could not find the batting. I have gone so far as to ask the family members who helped us move if they could check their vehicles and see if the box got shoved under a seat or something, which highly unlikely and in fact did not happen. So at this point I do not know where the batting is. I, I, I don't know if I still own it. I don't know if somehow it got tossed out during the moving process or if it got shoved into another box me thinking it was something else during the move. So I don't have any batting and I you know I resigned myself to just go ahead and buying the new much more expensive batting which is the exact same batting as I had uh, unfortunately, a lot of the reviews now, more recent reviews, are indicating that there might be some shrinkflation going on with the inflation. Uh, there's a lot of problems with it not being um, consistent thickness and being too thin in areas, which is, uh, I've been burned by batting twice now. The last two quilts I made, I had uh, some really bad batting. And I do not want to go through that again. I just want wool in the middle. I don't want to do polyester. I just, I want what I want. And so I've gone with a different um, strategy. I went on eBay and I purchased several um, vintage army blankets. These are 100% wool. And most of these have gone through a few, uh, they're in need of a second life. Um, a lot of them have, you know, holes and whatnot, but um, they're still, you know, 100% wool, and this sort of hole isn't going to mean much in the middle of a quilt that is, you know, quilted and everything. So I'm going to go with these blankets. I've got two for uh, Samuel's quilt. And um, I'll get some more for Robert's quilt. But since this is a legit blanket all on its own, all I really have to do is um, just secure it in point. So I can, if it won't fit underneath my sewing machine, not a big deal. I'll be able to hand stitch just some um, secures to keep the layers together. So today I will be sandwiching all the quilts together. It's going to be getting pretty cold the next few nights and I want to get it, if it's not done, I at least want to get it to the point where my son can use it overnight if he needs to. So here we go.
The thing is, if I don't do these basting stitches as much of a pain in the butt as they are to do, then through the process of uh, laying the top part on and just the difficulty in keeping everything in place, the finished quilt will end up with a lot of air gaps along all of these seams. And that kind of defeats the purpose of trying to make a warm quilt to have a lot of air gaps like that. So while these are in no way meant to be structural, their entire purpose of these basting stitches is just to keep the wool pieces in place uh, relative to each other as the quilt is being finished. Uh, they are kind of essential if we're going this route. I just simply cannot make a quilt without all these air gaps unless I do this step. I'm also taking the opportunity to use some of that leftover patch to cover up some of the larger holes that I think might end up in the quilt. Just have, uh... So I've really just, you know, taken a little patch and I'm just gonna cover that up and uh, base it closed. I believe this was a uh, 1940s or 40s, 50s, or 60s era army blanket. And it's clearly gotten a lot of use. It's noticeably thinner than the the new version that uh, I also purchased. That's basically it was manufactured back in the same time frame, but was never used. It was just put in storage and was in a great bin and now being sold. So. The middle part of this, uh, the, the, the intact blanket that I'm using was never actually used in a military sense. It was simply manufactured for the military and then put into storage. But this one has clearly already served a lifetime. And normally if you were doing something like this but you weren't encasing it in uh, layers of fabric, you weren't encasing it in this uh, bottom and top cotton, uh, you'd want to serge the edges uh, or do something with these raw edges to make sure they don't fray out. Uh, however, this entire contraption is going to be encased, so none of these edges are ever actually going to see daylight. Which means I don't have to worry about. One really cool thing about these old blankets, and you can see it, like I said, my patch has been patched, but when there's a small hole, you can, it's not really a true darning, but you can use a thread to sort of close up the hole and just sort of knit it back together. This is all hand stitched. That's someone who was trying to repair the blanket uh, over there too on the patch. But it's uh it's a thread that matches more or less to the blanket, so this may have been a military member out in the field um, just doing repairs on his blanket in the evenings when he had time. Um, or it could be someone like me who was using it in civilian life. Oh, if these blankets could talk. Okay, so I have wised up a little bit and I am... Uh, removed all of my bedding from our king size bed and I have put the quilt on here and I'm going to try to attach the top of the quilt this way. I've, uh, I've taken all the sheets off and I'm um, washing those as we speak. Uh, ideally you have a hard surface to do this on because I'm going to be using 
uh, quilting pins, basically giant safety pins to uh, scoop up and hold all three layers together. And uh, if you have something soft underneath, uh, you can poke that. Now, um, we're just going to see how that works. This isn't anything I can actually pull up. It's just a mattress. So we'll see how that works. I'm going to start from the bottom. Um, and the reason for that is because I have this nice surged edge of this, uh, this fully intact army blanket, the, the newer one that's in good shape. And I want to try to match that up as much as I can and preserve as much of this original blanket as possible. So we'll see how that works. And this is really what you want to end up with. Let's see if you can see it here. Um, you have your top layer, your middle layer, your bottom layer. And you want each layer, as you get to the top, to get smaller so that you have, uh, so that it's just easier to work with. But for the most part, you just want, you want to make this bottom section that no one cares about, uh, make that as bigger than you think you're going to need it. Make, give yourself plenty of room your batting, you don't want to try to match your your top quilt to the exact size as your batting. You want it just a few inches smaller just to make your life so much easier when you get to this point. All right, and what I've got here is a bunch of basically oversized uh, safety pins. And we're just going to connect all the layers together with that. So now the fun part. Now we get to see how much I this quilt I can get underneath my singer to actually attach the layers. And I forgot to count to see where the middle was. I guess we'll find out. Alright, I've got two lines that are quilted and what I'm doing now is actually doing the actual quilting. So I've got this whole line stitched, this whole line stitched, and I've got this whole line stitched. So that entire row along the quilt um, lengthwise is done. And I am having some uh, bunching and resettling over in this area that happens, as best as I can tell, um, especially since I don't have a huge flat surface that I can keep everything really neat and tidy on. So in order to minimize shifting and bunching as much as possible, I'm going to try to work from the center out and try to work from a few different directions first to stabilize the quilt. So I have rolled up, uh, this is from top down, I'm now going to roll from the bottom up and probably do another two lines. I'll try to count and find where the center is this time. And then I'll do the same thing for the sides. And once I have, you know, those two rows stabilizing in the center, I'll be able to just pick a direction and move out. Um, and uh, if 
finish it up and it's going pretty good. Um, I was impressed I was able to fit that much under the uh, sewing machine and I think I could fit more so see if I can find that center. Okay so I have rolled it all up in all four directions and gotten at least two lines in each direction stitched. And you can even see in some of the places it's uh, where all those squares are fully um, enclosed in stitches, it's actually starting to get a bit of a loft. And one of the things you might be asking if you've never done this before is why on earth am I going through the trouble of folding up each side and stitching just a few things when I could roll it up and do that whole section and then roll it, uh, roll the new section and roll it, stitch and do that. And the reason for that is the layers of fabric will shift in real time as it is being stitched. So if you just did all of one side, um, all going in the same direction, all in a row, you did them all, you may end up with a situation where the fabric is actually pulling to a corner. And over here, some of that has started to happen here. You can almost see there's like a little wave where that fabric is being pulled in a direction. And it's not just because, you know, it's put up like that, but there's actually a little pulling and bunching going on. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to identify where the worst of that is coming from. And I'm pretty sure it's, uh, this, well, if I'm folding in that direction, uh, there's some in-between place because I didn't have the first middle. So I think uh, this here is the middle stitch and my first was over here. And this section in, in the middle here is going to be my problem area. So I'm going to roll up now that I've got my four sides all stabilized. I'm going to roll up from this direction. I'm going to remove all the pins in the middle here. Uh, I'm going to roll in that direction and I'm going to stitch out. Just go ahead and do all that side. But yeah, from here on out, it's just a matter of uh, getting it done. So the quilting is done. All the lines have been quilted. It is done. So the only thing left is the binding. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to cut all of this extra material away on the edges over here. Uh, and I already have the binding ironed up and I will attach the binding and this quilt will be done. There are two parts that get sewn. So first you sew on the back to get it secured and then you fold it over and sew on the front. So I need to go and pin. I don't have a lot of pins, but I have enough. I should be able to make at least uh, the first line here. I need to pin this right to the edge of the blanket. Let's see here. Can we see that? Alright, so we have a couple creases from the iron and I'm going to fold on the inside of this crease. That way it will be secure here and this is the side no one cares about, right? And then that will allow me to, using how it's already folded, it will be secured that way and it will fold over onto the side people do care about. Alright, like this. And then I will sew right on the edge here and then that will have it nice and uh, pretty and hopefully even or even enough 
So this is what I'm looking for here. Uh, I've got it pinned. You know, it's not stretched or anything. It's just laying flat, as flat as I can get it. I can see uh, all the raw edges together here. And then I will sew inside this crease, this first crease here. All right, and now I have come to the dreaded first corner here. So I am going to, I want to take it all the way to the end here, to the, the tip of the corner. Uh, but what I'm going to do is this pin I'm going to put in all the way to the corner, but at a diagonal. So it can help me here. So put these pins at a diagonal. And then I want to fold the bias tape at a 45 degree angle away. This is the pretty side. This, this particular fabric doesn't have a pretty side or a, a wrong side. Uh, but if your bias tape had a pretty side, this would be the folding up part, you're now seeing the pretty side. And then I fold it back uh, so that the raw edges now meet for the other side going down. And that doesn't look right at all. This is bias tape folded up and then turn right back around here and fold it down so that the raw edges again meet up. And that's not really making a very nice thing. That should be making a nice um, square. So that means I need to adjust my 45 degree angle. And you know why it's not making a nice 45 degree angle? It's because the blanket is not at a 45 degree angle. <laughs> I, uh, I ran out of some, uh, some army blanket there. So that one we're gonna have to uh, have to eyeball that one. That's why it's not working. Okay, well, good to know. But yeah, so normally if, if your blanket were square you'd have a nice square like that, but my blanket is very clearly not square. Uh, so we're just gonna do our bestest there. I'm just going to go until I run out of pins here, and then I'll sew, reclaim the pins, and keep on. And that much left over. I'm done with that bias tape. Okay. I like the other side. Uh, well, yeah, that's the side we work on. <laughs> no, this side that you're working on. You, you like this side, which yeah. is the plane? No. You like this side? Yeah. Yeah, everyone likes it. This is the side we work hard on. And it's colorful. Yeah, that's the idea. Something pretty to look at. I'm not exactly sure where to start, so I'm just gonna start. Right here. Yeah. What can I tell the audience? Oh, I think we're good for now, Big Manskis. But what do we tell the audience even more? Ah. Well, probably a few of them have, have not played Minecraft, so I'm going to just safe. tell them. It's a safe bet. I've never played Minecraft either. Yeah, so I'm going to tell the audience how to play Minecraft. Alright, you go tell the audience how to play Minecraft. So guys, I'm going to teach you all to how to play Minecraft. So to play Minecraft, you just need to hit play, and then and you just have to wait for a little while, and then. And have you ever played Minecraft? I saw someone and start playing it, and you have to wait. You can tell where the the world is made. Okay, let's check it. But no, we don't have the game called Minecraft. Okay, I didn't think so. Grandma does not have it either. Yeah, no. I, I'm not surprised that Grandma does not own the game Minecraft. But to play Minecraft... Mm. What? Oh, nothing. Just got a little squirrely there. Well, well, you did make a sound of a villager. I made a sound of a villager? In Minecraft. Of course. Villagers in Minecraft sound like this. <laughs> <laughs> 
And you can just do normal stuff in Minecraft. You can do normal stuff like fight zombies. And and, you and, can and, and dive into lava. And and die in lava and fight creepers and one day explode you die with creepers. <laughs> what? You die with creepers when creepers explode in Minecraft. Okay. I mean if you get very close to them and and they you start exploding exploding and you die immediately. Well when they explode. Code. Sounds like the best option. So stay away from creepers immediately. Alright, I will try to stay away from creepers. That's, that's just generally good advice, I think. Okay, so in part one, I promised to keep track of my time when I was doing all of the sewing and quilt making and uh, report back on the overall time cost for a quilt like this. This is a queen. It has custom embroidery work somewhere. Yep. Custom embroidery panels all throughout. You can see exactly how I made the quilt top in part one. Now I have three quilts I intend on making this winter. This is the first one and uh, at least for the two for my boys this has been a project I have been planning for quite some time. So I'm not entirely certain on some of the early stuff, but I have been keeping better track of the time since I decided to actually do a video on it. So first is for the embroidery work in the quilt. That I have about nine hours roughly in, but that is for three quilts worth of embroidery. So we'll divide that by three and have three hours just for this quilt. The cutting of all of the squares this is the only part I'm not entirely certain how much time I've logged in on this because this was done piecemeal, you know, two hours at a time as I didn't have anything else to do that day over, you know, months where just it, I was reminded that I had this project I was working on. Um, I'd say probably about 10 hours of cutting roughly and I cut out enough to make two of the quilts so five hours of just cutting these squares for this quilt. Most of that I can do like I mean these these squares here that don't have any, any embroidery I cut that on my um with my rotary cutter on my mat and I can do five six squares at a time with the same cut. But these embroidery squares, first I have to cut them to put them on the machine, and then I have to cut each one individually after I center um, my 4x4 square there in order to get that design. So that's probably, again, I'm not entirely certain on that, but we're going to say roughly five hours in cutting just to get the squares done. To make the quilt top basically all done in part one, all of that sewing was about 11 hours of just sewing these squares together to make the quilt top. Once the quilt top was done, I spent approximately four hours cutting out and ironing and sewing up the bias tape, the, um, this part. Another four hours doing the batting layers and pinning all three layers together. Seven and a half hours doing the actual quilting and fighting with the quilt, you know, getting it all rolled up and feeding it through the machine. And then another hour and a half doing the binding, the actual sewing on there, getting it positioned correctly, getting it pinned, sewing it on. So all in all, as a total, there is 19 hours just in the quilt topper and another 17 hours assembling the quilt as a whole for a total of 36 hours of labor to create one queen size handmade quilt. So it's, it's very much a labor of love. This isn't the sort of thing you get into unless you kind of enjoy doing it. Um, yeah, it took a lot of time and it took a lot of effort, but also at the same time, this is a blanket. My, my son is seven years old right now, and 
there's really no reason he won't be able to wrap his grandchildren in this quilt. Uh, this is because it takes that much time. These quilts tend to stick around because they do have sentimental value. I didn't have to buy any fabric for this quilt at all. These were all fabric pieces that were left over from my Etsy business, uh, which I had to sell in order to make this big move. But yeah, 36 hours roughly. And that's for someone with my experience level. Um, I know in the comments of my part one, there was a lot of recommendations on how I could have done this faster, which I might have to look into for the next quilting. But so I had only made two quilts before. I had made them at the same time. So I'm not a complete newbie when it comes to quilt making, but also I'm hardly, this isn't exactly my main hobby or anything like that. This is something I do when I have a need for a quilt and I don't mind putting in the time. Really, I just knew my kids would be needing some super warm blankets. Uh, they're just kids now, so a queen is convenient because they can double it over and uh, have double the layers of this nice warm wool blanket. And also, this is something that they can take with them when they grow up. It's really hard to take like a, a twin quilt with you when you grow up because for the most part, most adults don't have a twin size bed. so. They somewhat struggle with how to use this thing, and it's a quilt, it's a practical item, it's meant to be used. Um, and so even when you have something like this that has been made for you, and you know, love and care and attention has been put into it, uh, if it's not the right size for you, it, it can be difficult to continue to use it even if you want to keep hold of it. So I went ahead and I made it larger and I made it a queen size so that it can just naturally follow them into adulthood. I wanted that for them. And that's it. Thank you guys so much for watching. Um, let me know in the comments what you think and uh, if there's anything else you'd like to see. I'm fine with making more quilting content. I'm just not sure what else to video for this sort of thing that I haven't already done and that wouldn't just be repetitive and boring. So I'm going to be making quilts. Um, I just don't know if they're going to be up on the channel or not. <laughs> we found the batting! We found the batting! <laughs> so it was, it was at the neighbor's house, the neighbors who helped us move and Apparently I had shoved it in the bottom of a box with a bunch of packing material from my old business, a bunch of uh, shipping boxes and things, um, before I had the idea of, hey, you know, they're buying the whole business. Maybe they just want all this stuff too. And so I had moved it over there, I had dropped it off for them, and they were going through it and they're like, hey, we found your box of bad. My batting. I'm not crazy. At least, you know, not in that way. So, since I have already purchased the army blankets, and obviously I have already completed one blanket, and I already have the uh, army blanket batting for the other uh, queen blanket, I have decided I will absolutely be using these. I have two queen sized uh, wool battings in here that I purchased last year. So I think what's going to happen is I will be making an oversized king for my husband and my bed. And hubby is a very hot sleeper and I'm a very cold sleeper. And I, I ran the math and there is actually enough batting here where I can do a layer of wool and then on my side of the bed, because after 15 years we just have a side of the bed, on my side of the bed will be a double layer of wool. So that's what we're gonna do with this because I found it. <laughs> so I cannot tell you how happy I am that we found this wool bedding. I'm like unreasonably happy that we found this wool bedding. <sighs> and I got to find deep woods. Oh, here it is. Okay. I will my 
son, Samuel, that's my name, love mommy, oh, to keep you warm, love mommy, only 23. Make <laughs> <laughs> such a... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> can you spell this out? I can, awesome. <laughs>